Hi, everybody, and welcome back. If you're just joining us, this is DeFi or DeFi, and it's our 2022 FinTech conference. We have a terrific afternoon lineup, starting with our second practitioner panel, bridging the gap between DeFi and CeFi. And I'm going to be very pleased to introduce the moderator, moderator Dan Caputo. Before I do that, I want to give a big shout out to our conference sponsor this year, Silicon Valley Bank. Dan, over to you. Thank you, Kathleen. And thank you, NYU and Stern, for having me today. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Dan Caputo. I am a proud NYU alum from the Gallatin School, class of 2010. I'm currently a director on the FinTech Relationship Management Team at Silicon Valley Bank. SVB is a full stack bank that's laser focused on the venture and technology ecosystems. So we have a commercial bank, which I'm a part of. We have a private bank, which is for uh, founders and general partners of funds. We have an investment bank and we have an investment arm um, that makes direct investments in companies and a fund of funds practice through SVB Capital as well. And lastly, we do have a wine lending practice out in Napa. Uh, as well. So uh, I, I focus my time on banking venture-backed uh, fintech companies in New York and on the East Coast. A major part of Silicon Valley Bank's fintech practice is working with companies in the crypto and blockchain spaces. Um, in the U.S., SCB works with over 100 crypto businesses, representing well over $3 billion of total client funds. So I'm very excited to moderate this panel today, and as the commercial banker on the on the group, I'm by far the least interesting person on it. So let's get started. Um, for some quick intros, I will pass it over first to Mike Dudas. Hi, Mike Dudas. Uh, been in the crypto space for four years and have had four different interesting roles during that time. Founded The Block, which is a crypto media research and info business. Uh, ran Paxos's stablecoin business development. Uh, for a year. Uh, I run $125 million venture capital fund, early stage fund called Sixth Man Ventures, uh, and recently founded a project called LinksDAO that's um, a sort of global community governed golf club, golf and leisure club. Thanks, Mike. Eva? Hi, my name is Eva Balin. I started my career in New York as well in management consulting and then defected to Ethereum when I realized payments were much more interesting on-chain than off-chain. Um, since then, I've worked at the Ethereum Foundation, Omise Go, um, and helped launch the Graph Protocol and indexing and querying layer for all blockchain data. And now I serve as director of the Graph Foundation. Awesome, thanks. Lastly, Ryan. Hey, so Ryan Todd, I'm, I'm research lead for digital assets at FinTech Collective, an early stage venture fund uh, based on New York City. We invest globally, C and Series A stage. Uh, I too, uh, I, I guess I started out in traditional finance. I did equity research, covered financials and payments, caught the crypto bug early on based off of a client inbound and never looked back. I worked at um, Consensus for uh, the, the depressing year of 2018. And before working for actually Mike at the block, I was the first research hire um, to help build out the research platform there at the block um, before joining FinTech Collective. All right. So maybe the first question I'll, I'll focus on the investors on the panel. So, so Ryan and Mike, but very exciting time, obviously, to be in crypto and Web3 and DeFi. And there's a lot of fundraising activity and a lot of company formation. So I'm curious for your views on what gets you excited about a founding team or a business model in the space? Are there any maybe subsectors within crypto that are more interesting to you than others right now? Yeah, I guess I'll start. So, you know, from a from a founding team perspective, uh, I you know, still have a, a tremendous bias for folks who uh, I, I would call native to the space. Uh, but what's beautiful about crypto, I always like to say, you know, uh, people are operating in areas where there are no experts, uh, which is really exciting. So you can become native to an emerging idea, concept, um, or you know, crypto application area that didn't exist six, nine months ago, uh, and you jump in. But I like to see folks who have at least had deep curiosity, you know, whether they've been researching in crypto 
uh, committing code, building, contributing to projects. That's the number one thing. Uh, and then, you know, I prefer when looking at early stage, we're early stage investors, as is Ryan. Uh, it, it's very, I much prefer to look at, you know, a working application you know, with, with customers or working product uh, versus scribbles, you know, on a deck. Uh, and we're definitely in a very, very you know, sort of frothy phase of the market, tremendous numbers of teams, some wonderful, incredible people, more than I've ever seen in any market I've ever participated in. At the same time, you know, there are a lot of kind of folks who are pay heard play to earn gaming is really interesting. And now they're building, you know, the 1,500th play to earn game. Right. Yeah, I think I would just, yeah, I think I would just add that, um, Obviously, different relationship or different, just like um, like me and Mike when we worked at the block. Like the, there, you have to try and be as objective as possible when when you're um, like covering the day to day developments in the space. Um, obviously, quite different, right? In venture, uh, you really get to champion your portfolio and founders. I think, kind of echoing what Mike said, um, for us, what really gets us excited is, and you can kind of tell um, if a founder or a team is a bit more mercenary or opportunistic. Um, it's not necessarily like they just joined the space, but um, you know, it's someone, it's a team that you actually have confidence that they really do believe in what they're building and, and their place in the broader industry. Um, also a team that you have confidence, you know, will be here building uh, through the thick and thin, whether that's when things get tough at the company level or when we inevitably do have a real bear market or down market, you know, just having that confidence that the teams are, are going to be, passionate in what they're building. Um, I think that's a big thing that we index on. And I think also kind of echoing what Mike said, I think for us, we tend to be a bit more valuation sensitive, uh, which has <laughs> precluded us from being active in things like DAO tooling and uh, NFT infrastructure, all the hot stuff that a lot of people are really excited about for good reason, clear market opportunities there. Um, but it's just been harder for us, um, given how frothy the market is, uh, to get that much conviction in some of these areas and pockets. Um, but yeah, I would say for us, it really does come down to just like how passionate and really truly do these teams believe in what they're building. And then I'd love to have one other thing. Where can we add value to you know, what the team is doing, right? So you know, I'm not a financial, a deep financial markets person like Ryan is, for example. So I'm not going to do an exotic you know, options protocol uh, investment. You have to make sure that you can actually support the team that you're investing in. So for us, it's like, you know, play to earn gaming, metaverse. Web3 networks, DAO tooling and infrastructure, NFT marketplaces, products that we use and love. And then the good thing for entrepreneurs in this space is that you have so many specialized VCs, DAOs, and angels investing that you know you basically can choose an incredible syndicate of complementary investors who can provide different services to you as an entrepreneur. Thanks. So, Ava, a, you know, a question for you, um, because I think uh, FinTech Collective is an investor in the token at The Graph. I'm curious for how investors like Mike's Fund and, and FinTech Collective that are relatively small compared to folks like a, a Tiger um, or other these large crypto funds, how do you manage a process in terms of raising capital where you want to be cognizant of the smaller checks, but maybe how they add value strategically? and also the larger checks maybe from, from Tiger? Yeah, great question. So uh, one thing about the graph that's very unique is that we really have a role for everyone. You know, whether you're a developer, that's the actual API developer, or you're a node operator, um, or you're someone like an investor, um, there's the role of being a delegator or a curator. And that means that you're actually using the GRT that you hold in the protocol to earn rewards or fees for the services you provide. Um, and with that, you know, then uh, we're whale agnostic and there's really no interest in the protocol in having um, too many very large investors that can, you know, overpower other indexers or overpower other users. Um, so it's it's actually really very much in the benefit of the protocol and the users of the protocol to have a diversity of contributors, whether that's more delegators who are delegating their GRT to an indexer, that's a node operator, um, and then earning a portion of their rewards, um, or using the GRT to curate on subgraphs. So that would be um, signaling, you know, which 
which APIs or which information is most interesting to the world. Um, we really encourage, you know, people of any size. Um, the cool thing about, you know, having different kinds of investors or supporters is also the skill set they bring. Um, so, you know, we're really um, wide ranging uh, community. You know, there's anything from um, cryptographers to really skilled community builders. Um, and our mission is so vast that we really need that. And so um, funds of all sizes bring that. Yeah, that, that makes sense, Eva. And I guess a follow up to that is maybe how do you think about capital raising in terms of potentially token sales versus more traditional Silicon Valley process of, of raising equity and, and selling capital or equity stakes in your, in your business? I'd love your take and then also get the investors, Ryan and Mike's as well. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I'm definitely very crypto native. So, you know, the idea of raising equity or IPOs to me just feels so incumbent and old. Um, when tokens, you know, achieve that plus more. Um, and what they really achieve is the ability for people in the team or people who help support the project to actually contribute and participate in the project. Like when you hold equity, you you can't do anything with it. You know, sometimes you have some governance rights, okay. But otherwise it's just stale sitting there and it becomes a speculative asset. That's why the SEC is so hard on these assets. Um, but utility tokens can be used. They can be leveraged in the protocol. You can add to the security, you can vote, you can um, contribute in different ways and then also earn rewards for that. So it becomes much more um, interesting that, you know, not only can the value of the project be derived in this asset, but you can then use that asset to um, increase the value or increase adoption of that uh, protocol or project. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as investors, uh, we do invest in equity and, and tokens, and there are some companies in the space um, you know, where it may not make sense to, to have a token. But you know, if, if you're investing in sort of Web3 or you're investing in crypto networks um, in the crypto space, you know, the idea is the token is typically you know, the mechanism for incentivization, for coordination, for governance, and for usage of the network, as Eva said. So uh, you know, if you're investing in equity, and in most cases, if a token exists, it, it's the place where sort of network value is going to accrue. Um, and you know, we are active participants in the networks that we invest in. So again, yeah, we'll stake, um, we'll delegate, we'll you know, provide liquidity and actually use the networks that we're participating in. Yeah, I would just add, echoing what both have said, um, I think being the fact that we are smaller, we've architected the team to be more nimble, this, uh, this amorphous term of, of being crypto native, like we've all been active in crypto for five plus years. Um, you know, we have a technical engineer that um, is going to be actually like looking for the graph specifically and why we actually did the deal is he, he just loves building subgraphs um, and is excited to get closer to the metal basically. Um, and so echoing what Mike and Ava said, um, you know, from our perspective, just being more active and, and really just trying to be a, a full community participant and actually leverage the value of these tokens. And, and that's kind of why we, we do yeah. the token deals. And from like an actual like entity perspective, uh, you know, one of the biggest reasons I'm in crypto and entered full time in 2018 is I started a traditional equity firm, uh, equity based, you know, SaaS startup that still hasn't had a liquidity event. And even as a founder, you know, if you're holding equity, uh, you can go eight, nine years before you, you know, sort of realize any benefit. It's binary, right? You either have to sell or you go public. Uh, whereas your know, tokens, you have some vest period, but then they're actually trading publicly. Uh, and again, they have multiple use cases. And therefore, you know, if you're working in a quality project, um, there's going to be a liquid market for those tokens. You can sell into it. And as a you know, participant in the network, um, you know, realize benefit sooner than traditional tech startup seven, eight, nine years. And it just shifts your know, power from, again, these centralized entities out to the edges. Yep. Thanks all. Um, I want to talk maybe about the centralized nature of this panel, right? I am a commercial banker. SVB is regulated by the Fed. Um, there still is a role, at least today, for banks to play in the crypto space. So one of the things we focus on, right, is compliance onboarding and understanding know your customer, understanding sanction screening, all that really fun stuff. But I'm curious for early stage businesses in the space from the investor spec perspective and yours, Eva, is how important is focusing on compliance early? Are we always thinking about potential regulation or do you want to go build a business and break things and ask for forgiveness later? 
Um, maybe Ryan, I start with you there. Yeah. So I guess the short, the short answer is it's obviously incredibly important. Something that's not only highly variable across jurisdictions uh, and quite fluid um, at like an industry level, but I guess for us at the fund level, you know, we take obviously compliance as seriously as possible. Uh, it's why we've actually launched um, as an investment advisor, registered investment advisor. Um, so that comes with high standards of compliance requirements, like having to custody assets out of qualified custodian. And actually in the, in the graph example, this is something that we're still working through, um, but it kind of like shows like why there, how there's still gaps in the market uh, for participants like ourselves. Um, you know, we want to delegate, we want to stake, uh, and we want to like be active with, with these token communities. But if a qualified custodian, which there's only a handful of, can actually custody the asset for us, we, we kind of have to wait until they can to be able to do that. Um, so that's just kind of like an example of, and it's something I didn't actually even appreciate when I worked at the block, um, still how early the, <laughs> the institutional compliance landscape is for supporting these, these networks and communities. Um, but it is, it's something that we take obviously incredibly serious. Uh, and that's really ultimately because of just the institutional LP base that we, that we have, um, and, you know, and having to have assurances around KYC and AML. And, um, if we're going to participate in DeFi liquidity pools, like knowing obviously who's on the under other end of that pool. So. Yeah, I would add that, uh, you know, obviously it's critically important in most cases, but I mean, you have, you have to look at the specific company project or protocol um, to, to answer that question accurately. I'll, I'll give you an example though. Like with LinksDAO, you know, we sold NFTs to individuals uh, and those NFTs cannot bestow, you know, ownership rights in the golf course that we purchase. Otherwise it would be an unregistered security sale because we sold an NFT you know, on the Ethereum network, you know, people use their MetaMask wallet to purchase it, self-custodied. We didn't do, you know, KYC AML. What we were able to sell instead was, again, a governance token um, uh, that has, you know, some, some voting rights uh, via the NFT and then the right to purchase a membership later and, and some perks and benefits. But it's really tricky. The other thing I'll say is you're, you're really never, in most cases, uh, proactively and in advance going to be able to get a clear picture or answer on, you know, whether what you're doing is going to be approved by every relevant regulatory body, or even what is the relevant regulatory body. Uh, and, and they may not know, and, and the winds are sort of shifting constantly. So you do have to sort of make some sort of calculated risk decisions. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't say it's like YOLO or you know, um, move fast and break things, but try to make reasoned decisions uh, based on precedent that you see, because many regulatory bodies in the U.S. and elsewhere enforce um, through, you know, enforcement action versus rulemaking. Eva, any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm curious as well in terms of your work with eGirl Capital and how important the Anon focus is to that. Yeah, I wouldn't say I have that much experience with like traditional compliance um, in terms of how, um, you know, eGirl Capital operates. We are um, a group of mostly anons. There's a few docs members. Um, and we realized pretty early on that, like, you know, the, the way we interact with our coworkers or, you know, the people we work with, um, colleagues in clubs or extracurricular activities, you, you learn a lot about them. Um, and we recognize that pretty quickly we had a lot in common. We were also able to trust each other's um, perspectives and expertise, um, having come from different backgrounds, whether that was, you know, security engineering or being a solidity dev or business leader. Um, and so we operate kind of like a DAO um, where we kind of take everyone's perspective. It also hedges, you know, against our own risk. Um, and we choose investments based on, you know, how the group feels. So, you know, most of the investments, um, you know, are not um, uh, deals that everybody partakes in, um, but enough of the group do that it becomes an e-girl investment. Makes sense. <clears throat> so maybe um, taking one step further in that, I'm curious, I'll start with you, Mike, because we have a, a working relationship at SVB. Um, what's it like working with a bank on a project that could be potentially tricky to onboard like a DAO or a crypto fund? You can be blatantly honest. And I'm also curious for all of your perspectives on like, what is the role of the centralized bank and regulated bank 
in this space in the next five or 10 years? Is there a vision where you actually don't need bank accounts and fiat currencies? Mike, starting with you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, today, the it's certainly very challenging to deal with uh, regulated financial institutions of all types. Paxos, where I worked, you know, SVB, where you work as a customer, you know, I'm a customer as a project, uh, as a investor. Um, one, you know, there, there's just not, a, you guys are one of the few really high quality regulated providers out there. So you know, don't have, uh, you know, it's, it's challenging, right? To just for, for you folks to onboard folks, it takes time. Um, and, and the bar is really high in terms of the document, documentation that's provided. Um, for a fund like ours, you know, we have US and international entities in order to be able to invest in tokens. So that again, raises the bar significantly. And same on the exchange and regulated exchange front. I also have, and uh, you know, some of us look all do, I think the unfortunate uh, for crypto situation uh, that I reside in New York City um, and we have you know, the bit license, which is an absolute flaming disaster. Um, that you know inhibits us from frankly being able to do things that are reasonable that other folks you know in other parts of the world can do, like I can't open an FTX account or a Binance US account, um, which makes it harder to do business. So it's challenging, uh, and yeah, at this point, you know the the crypto ecosystem today, it, in terms of the capital flows coming in, are still critically reliant on you know traditional banking, um, but it's obviously clear. That a small and growing economy is is building up of uh, you know projects that are sort of interdependent. Where once I get Ethereum, Solana, or other tokens into a wallet, there are actually applications that I can use them in, uh, and people you know who will accept them as as currency. Where a, again, very small but emerging economy that is separate from the traditional banked economy, and I think that will continue to grow. And there will be a portion of people's net worth, a portion of their value that they have, that actually never needs to move you know, back into the traditional banking system. But I think you know, a person like me will always have a significant reliance on uh, on regulated financial infrastructure and, and entities like yours. Thanks. Right. Yeah, I'll take the the latter. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time at the block thinking about this, and obviously, research banks and consumer finance companies. I think the long term vision of like being your own bank doesn't make sense for for most people, but it is amazing that we have that option. I think in terms of like, will banks exist long term? I think on the consumer side, that's where you see the highest potential for disintermediation. We already have. Um, both crypto native digital wallets, but also traditional digital wallets, Web2 version. Um, and that's slowly continuing to take share, I would say, of just consumer banking and finance. Um, but I think on the corporate side, it's just like there is a lot to be said about the relationship aspect. Um, I really thought about maybe like Dow community banks. I think that could be interesting because you actually do have the human element there. Um, but in short, yeah, I think I think there's most opportunity for like consumer finance disruption coming from crypto, less so on the corporate side, because to Mike's point, you definitely need these regulatory institutions and re regulated finance to like move the velocity and, and quantum of capital that corporates need. Um, uh, maybe that changes in the next decade plus, but for now, that's just kind of the reality of the situation, I think. Yeah, I can just top off with um, I think banks really are going to have to learn how to compete and what is um, the opportunity cost of capital for the end user where, you know, e even our senators are like, yeah, go, you know, put $5 in, in the bank for whatever measly little percentage. Um, whereas in cryptocurrency or blockchain world, you're able to not only contribute to a protocol and, you know, feel that you know, empowerment, but the yield you're earning is just significantly higher. So I think banks are going to have to understand what is their place. Um, do they become stakers themselves or do they provide delegation? Um, like what is that role in kind of the cryptocurrency supply chain that they take on? Great. Thanks. <clears throat> Makes me scared for my job in five or 10 years for sure. Um, let's talk maybe about layer one blockchains and Ethereum. I think Eva, you mentioned that the protocol for the graph is built on Ethereum, how do you all think about competitors to layer one blockchains? And is, I guess, also want to think about how you think about the underlying token, like the ETH token or the Solana token or Cardano, et cetera. But 
Uh, let's start with you, Eva, and then go around the horn. Yeah, so the graph is definitely built on Ethereum, and we are optimizing for scaling on Ethereum, um, but we're itself uh, blockchain agnostic, meaning we're interested in serving every chain. It's really not our business to help you know, a developer choose or force them to choose a specific chain. Um, and so we're here to basically provide data access from all blockchains. So we, we like to say index everything or index all the world's data. Um, what that really means is the subgraph becomes a standard API layer across chains. So not only for Ethereum or EVM based developers, but anyone building on Solana or Near, um, they can all start to coalesce around this standard API, which will actually make it a lot easier for developers between ecosystems to start either collaborating. Um, either on the front end or even the back end. Um, in terms of the tokens themselves, I think we're, we'll start seeing a lot more fundamentals driven um, pricing you know, over the next few years. And a lot of that will be based on the developer community, what's actually getting built, um, what are, what's the maturity of the developer tooling. Um, you know, so Ethereum definitely has a bit of a head start there. Um, but you know, there's other chains that provide different features that developers are looking for that Ethereum doesn't. And so um, we're here to support if that is the case. Like Orion, thoughts on layer ones? I don't have much to add based on what Ava just said, um, outside of just recognizing still how incredibly early um, these protocols are. Obviously, ETHs define the category as like a smart contract platform. Um, and to Ava's point, like has an incredible, I, I think it, that's the moat, is, is the developer community head start. Um, people are comfortable waiting uh, for, like changes to the protocol and, and, and updating Ethereum. And that's kind of given some room to like other use cases, like chains that might have higher throughput and scalability. But um, I have a hard time personally, unless there is a fundamental driver, just given my background um, and like actually having conviction in, in which token is going to perform better than others on a long-term basis um, at this stage. I think one thing that is easier to point to for, for ETH specifically is the EIP-1559 that got implemented. So all gas fees are, are now effectively removed from token supply. And so you can kind of back into this um, productive capital asset type valuation or at least mindset framework uh, in terms of evaluating that token. Um, you know, there's talks of, of doing similar things for other chains. Um, but I think for, for me, at least, it's still quite early. And outside of looking at community, um, unique active wallets and um, just general capital flows. It, it's it's kind of it's it's hard to really get that much conviction relative to each other. At least that's my view. Yeah, and then we're just you know basically not. I'm not a uh, layer one investor, so we're focused typically on the application layer, and we'll follow where you know the best teams and invest in the best teams and developers. Um, within reason, obviously, as Ryan said, as Eva said, we want to see, you know, a healthy user base and some you know, realistic, uh, you know, likelihood over a 12 to 20 more month period that if somebody's building, for example, a play to earn game or building an NFT marketplace, um, that there will be users on that protocol. Uh, and so you know, most of our investments have been, you know, in Ethereum layer one, you know, Polygon, uh, uh, Flow, and Solana, you know, based applications. So, so you know, comp teams building on those on those four protocols. Um, started to look at you know some other ones like Avalanche. I think we have one Avalanche investment as well, which is an EVM compatible um, chain. We have one minute. Last question. I want to ask. There's obviously been volatility in the crypto markets over the past three, five, six months, and and memes. How do you all think about the correlation, if there is any, between the volatility in the cryptocurrency and tokens and your ability to build Web3 and DeFi businesses in, in this environment? I'll start with you, Eva. I personally love bear markets. I think that's where most things are built, um, assuming that teams are sufficiently well capitalized that they can, you know, fund their runway. Um, but really, like if you look at layer twos, you know, even the graph, most protocols were built in that sort of 2018, 2019 bear market. Um, and bull markets can get really distracting. Not only is there just a lot of users that you have to kind of deal with, um, but you're you're experiencing the hype of the market and, and, and the 
momentum. Um, and it kind of d- doesn't allow for as much research focused time. So, um, you know, I welcome another bear market. I think there's a few things that on the infrastructure side, especially in Ethereum and other chains, you know, we're not quite there for mainstream adoption. Um, and so if that happens, you know, I'm, I'm feeling confident that most projects have enough runway to, to, to make it through. Any other quick thoughts from Ryan or Mike? We might be at time. Uh, just investor hat on it. Like, absolutely. Bear market is great to just digest everything that's transpired over the past 12 to 18 months. It's been incredibly like impossible to keep up with everything. Um, so more time for reading and, and, and really drilling down deeper into, into some of the cool stuff that's happening on the edges. Um, I guess the last thing I would just call out would be, um, it's interesting to see, and it's not unexpected, but just the fact that obviously correlations to broader risk assets continue to be, um, near or at all time highs. Um, obviously sometimes they'll change depending on market environment, but, um, you know, that doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So from like price appreciation or returns, like clear correlation to risk assets, I don't think that's going to change, um, for the time being. I think we're at time. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you everyone for listening and thank you to NYU and Stern. Back to you, Kathleen. Hey, Dan, you guys, thank you so much. That was a really interesting panel. I think we got a great view on what's going on on the frontier for investors, responses to the volatility in the market, and some really great detail about the layer one protocols and the application layer as well. And then um, thanks, Dan, too, because you gave us an illustration of DeFi and TradFi uh, actually cooperating together in the new ecosystems. That was cool, too. Thank you, guys.